All right, guys, we're back. This week, um, we have a custom knife maker. And, Jordan, I think you dipped your toe in making a couple knives at home. I pretended I mean, to make knives. Yeah, I, I, I was could say pretended. I made a couple, but like I could not do scales. I could not shave handles. Same my I life. just, I mean, the whole thing to me, because I... There's a lot of science. Uh-huh. There's, you know, understanding, you know, metals and metal blends and different mm-hmm. hardness and hardening. And, you know, you hear about what... You're saying words, aren't you? High carbon <laughs> content, <laughs> low carbon steel, and <laughs> aluminum. I don't think you make knives out of aluminum. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just, I'm really. just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, what we have today, we have Evan... From Simbita Knives, and then you've got our buddy Jared from uh, uh, Cutting Edge Cutting Edge Outfitters. Wow, I don't know why I just drew a blank. So, Evan, man, we're super happy to have you on here. I didn't butcher your name, right? Super we talking to be about, here. Thank you. Uh, we were, yeah, we were yeah. talking about this before we started, so I didn't <laughs> sound like a jerk, and then I got really like, oh no, I butchered it already. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny. I just I just watched for the first time the Evil Dead series, you know, because okay. Halloween nice. around there. And he like has to say some Latin of whatever, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I got it." Then he gets to the time, and he's like, "Oh, what was that word?" Yeah, ah, you know, so, close enough. <laughs> or like an Inglorious Bastards when they're trying to speak Italian. Arrivederci, yeah. buongiorno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Evil Dead series is great. Good uh, reference, is, man. Yeah, man, that's awesome. It's great. Yeah. So, so but Evan, yeah, did so I butcher that? Knives and uh, no, you got it right. You actually got it right. Okay, and, good. Uh, it's Polish, so the spelling is all whacked out, but uh, we just have been Americanized over the years, so it doesn't pronounce quite like it's spelled. But, yeah, it is what it is. Sure. Spell so, spell it for everybody. A shameless self-plug, because that's you know, kind of your website, too. Uh, <laughs> it's S-I-E-M-B-I-D-A. Custom Knives. Simbida. Simbida. So my... So my how'd you land on that one? Yeah. <laughs> you said family, right? It's family. Your family's Dutch, Polish. Polish. Uh, I'm Polish. So, I was. I was about to say. I'm an inter- my wife's potato, family, potato. My wife's family is <laughs> Dutch, and they ha- their their last name has a bunch of extra consonants in it. So I get it. But back, <laughs> back to somebody <laughs> says anything about people that are Dutch, I think of Austin Powers. I can't help it. <laughs> the freaky, the freaky deaky Dutch. So, so no, Polish, no, no, no. His, his dad like. There's two things I can't stand: people that are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I forgot about that. So, so Polish. Oh, such a good line. Polish. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that came that the your the knife company name came from family name. You said, is that correct? Yeah, that's my last. That's my last name. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what you said it? You were we were talking about it. What it, what does it mean? What are what are the ideas? Oh. <laughs> So I, it's been confirmed. I don't speak Polish. No, it's fine. But I've got a, another buddy who's an, also a knife maker from, oh shoot, I think he's in Connecticut. And he's like from Poland, like old country, came over here as a teenager, heavy accent. He goes, oh yeah, that's exactly what your name means, actually. Um, but it means seven times poor. Apparently you break it down. It's like there's a couple words or roots of words that mean seven times poor. Not sure who, uh, who signed up for that last name back when people were picking out last names? But <laughs> are you saying that's, that's seven times four, as in after no, no, three no. or seven, seven times, times poor? No, poor as in like yeah. poverty. Yeah. So oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Who picks that if you're picking names? <laughs> I mean, my, I don't know, cause my family's yeah. The way I understand it, people picked out their last names at some point in yeah. history. And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> my my family's German, and they. They say when you know they hit when they came to the U.S. they changed their name. My last name is Brown, and they changed it from you know. And then there's a hundred stories, so it doesn't really matter. But they changed it slightly to just be Brown because it makes more sense and it's easier to pronounce. So yeah, it's funny. Like you said, people do just at some point decide like, oh, this is my name because there's not the internet keeping track of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Huh. All right. So. Custom knives, man. We've we've poked around your website. We've we've seen your Instagram. You know, you're a good buddy with the cutting edge guys. What got you into knives? Just tell tell your life story. Yeah, let's... go just dive in, <laughs> dive in, man. So, I've always been the kid that like you know I was a kid. I two things that always tripped my trigger, and that was 
hunting rifles, you know, like, well, guns in general, not just hunting rifles, but mostly it's hunting rifles fully and the knives. Way. Okay. I, I don't know why knives, the guns make sense. I don't know why with the knives, it's just always been cool to me. And as a kid, I thought it was really cool doing like the whole bushcrafty thing, like making sharp sticks and sticking them into the mud and making tents and stuff out of debris shelter, you know, debris and all that stuff. Sure. Anything that used a knife for field craft was really cool to me. Just an excuse <laughs> to use a knife, really. And at some point, I got into the bushcraft thing really big and discovered the custom knife world. There were some really cool knives that just did not exist. Like, the style just didn't exist in the production knife world. And my experience of production knives was Walmart. That was sure. it. <laughs> so we all started. We all like, absolutely started of these, there. Yeah, and I was like, man, some of these are really cool, and it's stuff you just, like, I've never held before. Stuff that, like, seems kind of normal now, but at the time was really crazy. Like, thick, spine, big, heavy knives meant for beating through logs, and mm -hmm. still able to scale fish and fillet fish with them, and crazy stuff like that. So, I was homeschooled, and as such, I'm messed up and can't talk to people, and, you know, I'm socially inept and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, right in I was here. gonna say I, I was gonna say that surprised I, me because you seem like you've gotten out of that shell. <laughs> oh, no, doing I, great. I, there was never a shell. There was never a shell. It's just a joke. But like I, uh, <laughs> because I was homeschooled, I feel like there's a lot of things that I wasn't inadvertently taught. Like you know, going to public school, like there's a lot of things that you're taught. Like oh, you know, time to get your books. You just get your books. And instead, I was homeschooled. So it was like, well, what curriculum? works best what we do last year that worked oh math kind of sucks so let's get a book over here like like everything's flexible i learned being homeschooled like you can mold the world around you to to work around you and so that diy mentality i was like well those are really cool and i don't have any money what if i made something and so i raided my dad's garage and he had a couple old files that he got in a bucket of junk at an auction like literally like a big old bucket of nuts and bolts there were some old rusted files and i got permission Got them glowing hot with a torch and stuck them in some sawdust to uh, anneal overnight. And I used an angle grinder and files to file that thing into the shape of a knife. It took me forever. And cobbled together some handle material out of some old fabric and some of my dad's fiberglass resin. And I still have that knife upstairs, but uglier than sin. But I was so stinking proud of that knife. Used it like crazy. Even took it with me to college. and. I, uh, picked it up again, I don't know, after I was about, yeah, I think right after I was done with college, I was working in a factory, and I thought, you know, I've got a little extra money to spend, so I bought some equipment, some, like, really cheap equipment, and started buying, like, proper knife steel, and, eh, one thing led to another, and I'm here now, <laughs> doing this full time. Hey, guys, I want to talk to you about one of our newest partners, it is Dirty Duck Coffee Company, these guys are making some of the best waterfowl centric coffee that you can have they've got all kinds of different flavors for you to choose from they've got some kick-ass merch and they're offering an exclusive deal for you guys our listeners um, on their website and just enter in storm 15 for an extra 15 percent off of anything they've got on the website so make sure you go check out dirty duck coffee and put in storm 15 for the best deal you can get that's awesome i mean i i've watched you know some of the shows where they make these knives and they're overly dramatized and all that and Talking about fortune fire yeah i think that's the one yeah wow. um, we've all seen <laughs> it. and then there uh, there's a guy locally here in dfw i should say um named terry shanks do you know mm -hmm. that name no uh, he he does custom knives and i guess he's kind of He's gotten pretty big. Yeah, he's kind of gotten on the on the board i guess and you know it's somewhat outside of my world but Seeing the difference in, you know, a, a nice knife you buy versus a custom knife, it's it's always night and day. And, and you know, poking, like we said, poking around your na your website um, and seeing what you're making and what you're using. You know, mo I do a lot of cooking. So your chef's knife's cool, your bony knife's cool, and then your your whiskey jack, that skinny knife, is looks really cool. And yeah, that kind of... So you're know, talking about the ptarmigan and the... Uh, whip, whippoorwill? The what is it? Whip, metalark. Yep. Metalark. 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 skinning, and then... The ptarmigan with chef knife. Ptarmigan yeah. with chef knife. And the whiskey jack's that skinny knife. Yeah. Um, so. You know, the, the, that, that whiskey jack, I feel, is going to be 
the most applicable to us and our audience, especially right now, you know, we're basically, it's November at this point, basically. Um, so, you know, we're, we're putting deer on the ground soon and, you know, hogs year round here. Um, w- w- let's talk about knife shape. I, you yeah. know, that's a bad transition there, but you know, I, it was, but you're doing yeah, it. It's real bad. It was, I'm you made it work. I'm usually better than that. Yeah. You know, that I'm just trying to I'm thinking <laughs> faster than I'm talking, which it's the worst. Um, so, <laughs> well, so the problem that, with podcasts like this is we're really into it for ourselves. Cause like, I love knives as well. And I really want to know what we're looking at when you're going to a custom knife. Like, yeah, you what take you, this. You're like, going to be better you, than me right now. Jordan. What are you looking Go. at <laughs> as far as, like, you were talking about, you you posted up a thing the other, uh, two days ago, I think, on Instagram where you're talking about skinning and how you don't put a gut hook on your knives because your angle... Tip weaker and all that. Yeah, your angle is there. So, like, like kind of... I'm trying to bring you into... Let's talk about Let, shapes and what the shapes do let's, yeah. for knives. Let's like, start at that whiskey jack. Just in you, know, you, all right. you you posted a bunch on your Instagram. You field test these because you do some moonlighting, as, doing some work at a taxidermist, which is awesome to which me. Which we're I'm gonna get into that well, later. Yeah, on. we'll get there. <laughs> but let's talk about this whiskey jack because that that seems to be the your skin and knife on your website. And you take it now because we're stumbling through this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the whiskey jack isn't actually my primary skinner. I've got several okay. that I personally, as like a user, not just a maker, but as a user, I prefer a couple other ones over the whiskey jack. But the whiskey jack is certainly an excellent knife. Um, but typically, whenever you're looking at knives, you've got three styles that are popular. The first one's a drop point. They're not as flashy looking, uh, but mm. everybody likes using them, myself included. And that's where basically the spine of the knife kind of dips down and meets the point, sort of like an asymmetrical football, like half football, if that makes sense, like a boat tail. Mm-hmm. And what that means is you have like a, a graceful curve in the spine, and you can put that tip in, edge facing up, spine facing down into the belly of a deer, and zip that down the belly without the tip poking into the viscera and spilling the guts. And that's kind of that's really the main purpose of a drop point in that application is for that purpose and from there uh you also have the clip point which is like somebody cut a sort of concave nip out of that hump in the spine Mm -hmm. and so it's it's got a concave nip and it usually has a false edge because uh well a lot of people buy it because it looks cool but the main purpose is to make that tip as thin and delicate and needle-like as possible that's the purpose of the clip point. And it has the issue of wanting to dig, though, into viscera when it comes to zipping open the belly of a deer. So I tend to steer away from those myself. I'll make them for people, but I steer away from them. And the last one is the trailing point, which suffers from the same issue as the clip point, but it gains a lot of things. And that's where the blade basically curves backwards with a subtle curve, kind of like a Persian style blade, you know, those crazy Persian daggers you see in movies. And that's sort of a trailing point. And the benefit of that is you can reach your fingers, like your finger up on the spine of that knife and not be, um, uh, like the, your, the meat of your hand isn't sticking between the line of the tip of the blade and the back of the handle. If you're a line between those two, your hand is actually down below that. So it's out of the way if you're working up inside. And it gives you a really delicate point. So when you're working around the cape, more importantly, on a buck, and you're, you know, working around, the hide is really tightly attached to muscles there because there's no sublayer of muscle like there is on the belly for twitch muscles. And it's a lot harder to work around, and that gives you a real nice, nimble point to work around all that stuff, which is kind of the benefit of that style, in my opinion. But they're all three good knives, and they're all three usable. You just have to be aware of their you know, strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, uh, as as you were talking, I was looking all three of those up, and it co- makes complete sense. Yeah, that, that drop point. Yeah, the keeping drop, it, yeah I'm keeping really it familiar off. with the drop point. Yeah. Um, all right. So what? So you were talking about you know you started out using a using a file, right? It's you know, a hunk of metal and hammer this into a knife, which. Or hammer, you know. Well, pound, I'm gonna pound stop it, you. Right? I, I didn't. I didn't actually hammer it. You, you, I'm stop you, you there. I didn't actually file it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I, uh, there's two, one quick note is there's two ways of making a knife, mm-hmm. generally. The one is forging. It's like forged on fire and you know, on TV and stuff. That's the real dramatic, really art form style of making knives. Absolutely baffles me that people can do that repeatedly and repeatedly. And it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. I don't do, uh, forging though. That's, okay. but yeah, for those who don't know, that's heating up metal until it's, uh, mobile. It's soft, kind of like clay, and you're hammering it into shape. Mm-hmm. I did take the other route, which is where I buy stock that's already, you know, already milled to a specific thickness. Mm-hmm. Say it's eighth of an inch thick in sheets or in bars, mm-hmm. and then I'll mark them, cut them, grind them, drill them, and make a knife that way from dimension stock. I still do my sure. heat treating and everything else. I still bring it up to you know, 2,000 degrees and all that stuff, but I'm not hammering it to shape. That's the difference. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. Absolutely. So, moving on from you, you say, okay, let's you you got these files. You you heat them with a torch, like you said, and then you ground them and file them, them, and you made a knife. But you know, you you basically don't know what that file is made of, pretty much, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So kind of ran uh, with it. Generally speaking, generally speaking, most files are made of one or two rough, you know, rough areas of alloy steels. And they're pretty basic carbon steel, so you can kind of guess with your heat treat. But yeah, you're, you don't know what you're getting. You know, especially with today, a lot of stuff's case hardened and not great <laughs> to make files with or make knives with. So yeah. So, so talking about metal to make knives, you know, you, you I'm, that, that, I'm that's more, the one that always gets me because yeah. I was going to mention I I started off with you know like carry knives, like folding knives uh, is what I carry every day. I always have a knife yeah. on me. Absolutely. And uh, I recently got a Benchmade knife, which I'm over the moon about. Like, I cut wire with it at work. I'm a mechanic. I, I, I do all kinds of stuff with it. And it's a S30V knife. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. man, it is. Is that a, is that a metal? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And it is like, and, you know, people want to tell them how much the knife costs. They're like, dude, I never buy a knife like that. People don't but understand, like, though. But, like <laughs> like I said, I cut, like, I literally take wire, like, I'll be rewiring a engine, and I'll take a wire and take my knife and literally cut the wire in half, and I don't sharpen my knife, and it's still, like, I can cut a box, I can do all kinds of stuff, it keeps that edge, and... Uh, I mean that's not ideal, but no. Sure. I mean most people you shouldn't do that with your knives. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows us. Don't, here, you, don't like, use your like, knives like, to cut metal, and don't, don't, don't use, use your... screwdrivers. By God, yeah, we've uh, all done it. Uh, but... <laughs> I, actually, if you look at my knife, I actually uh, arced a starter uh, with the backbone of my knife uh, to start an engine, and I have like arc marks all across the back of it, which is terrible for a knife. Uh, sure. but like, but that uh, it's still like, I mean, I don't. Yeah, you bought it as a, a tool, not a. Yeah, not a, you know, everyone knows us. Like queen. our shotguns are the same way. All my guns are tools. <laughs> They're not safe queens. Uh huh. Absolutely. Wait, you use your shotgun to arc starters? Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't. So, <laughs> uh, we've used as boat paddles. Uh, we've we've used them for a lot of different things than like, shotguns. Yeah. Unloaded, of course. Wink. <laughs> So you know this. Let's let's start. You you open this door. That yeah. this, this S thirty V. What does that mean, Evan? Okay, so SV30, when it comes to steel, like steel is not steel is not all the same, right? Mm-hmm. Like so, steel is is iron with carbon added. Once sure. you add carbon, it becomes steel. Sure. Uh, the there's quote unquote low carbon, and then there's high carbon. I again put quotes on that because it's kind of a sliding scale or you know moving target, but. Uh, low carbon steels are stuff like you make, I don't even know, I think, I want to say gun barrels are technically low carbon steel. Um, your construction grade steel, rebar, all that stuff is low carbon steel. Once you add a certain amount of carbon, the steel is able to take on hardness and actually harden and become much harder than iron is capable of being. And at which point you have all these changes in the metal and one of which is able to hold an edge and take abuse without softening and moving like iron does and at some point they discovered you can add other things to the iron um, in addition to carbon and you get alloys of steel so 
like uh, the one that, you know, most most of your high carbon steels uh, that are production made are in 1095. 1095 is just mm-hmm. steel with high carbon, and then they add things like chromium and vanadium and things like that to improve its performance. S30V is a super high tech stainless steel where they've added things to it to make it stainless so it doesn't rust. And uh, I mean, I could. I don't even have the uh, the chart with me, but there's a ton of stuff they added to it, sure. and it ends up being very wear resistant, pretty resilient, and pretty corrosion resistant at the same time. It's pretty high tech stuff. Expensive though. It's expensive to buy. It's expensive to machine, and it's hard to sharpen. Yeah, there's it, a trade off. It really is. Mine doesn't say anything, but this one I've got my pockets are cheaper on. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> You know, we've we've uh, you said ten ninety five, uh, uh, that that rings yeah, a bell. Yeah, you yep. hear that a lot in the, in the knife world. What does that mean? Is that just a certain blend, a certain alloy? Uh, yeah, it's an alloy. So uh, don't quote me on this. I want to say off the top of my head, I don't work with ten ninety five. So keep that in mind. No, you're um, not. there's the ten XX series steels. So there's ten seventy five, ten eighty four, ten ninety five. Um, yeah, there's a pattern there. The second or the last two digits of the number signify um, the fraction of a percent of carbon they added to it, if I remember correctly. So 1095 would be 0.95% carbon as the alloy, if I recall correctly. Um, Like I said, I don't work with that stuff very often. But, yeah, that's that's basically what it is. It's it's a basic high-carbon steel. It's it's good stuff. It's not expensive to source. It's inexpensive to machine. It takes a really good edge, and it holds it pretty well. It's pretty durable. Pretty well, pretty durable. <laughs> so, what what do you work with? like? You know, for your knives, which are all gorgeous, everything on your website, your uh, Instagram, well, like man, you. they're oh, they're great. So, well, what do you work? Thank with? you. I mean, it's, I'm sure there's different uh, based with, on the knife, but well, there, there's a few I work with. Um, I don't know if you guys how far the rap down the rabbit hole you want to go, but I'll Deep throw out you uh, say three of them that I work with. Um, but the the most popular one I work with is called A E B L. Okay. So um, just four letters. I don't know what the letters stand for, but it's a it's a Scandinavian or Swedish steel. I forget which country it came out of, but it's a stainless steel that is it's just into the realm of being considered stainless. So it's not like I would never make a diving knife out of it. Be on for starters, sure. Mm-hmm. But I mean, but for most of us, it's more than enough as far as corrosion resistance. It's extremely tough by stainless standards. And because stainless steels typically give up toughness to be to be stainless. And then the carbides in it are very fine. And that means that it's easy to sharpen and it takes a very, very fine edge. So with the proper heat treated, it'll hold an edge for a pretty dang long time, depending on what you're doing with it, and it's easy to sharpen. So it's that's my, my meat and potato steel. I do a lot with it. And then I also work with S thirty five VN. Which is like your S thirty V, only it's a improvement on it, so it's a little bit tougher. Those are probably the two most popular steels that I work with right now. I'm interested in that one. Okay, (laughs) so (laughs) one of your knives is a bony knife, which we all know. You know, you want some flex to it. Which one of those two has more flex? Uh, Oh, so flex is not flex is actually. More of a function of geometry, not a function okay. of the alloy. Okay, so that makes sense. I just didn't know if you yeah. know, one one led to better better flexibility or not. You can tell we we're not savvy in all this stuff. But yeah, this we, understand. No. This you, super, no, we this understand. super. Super interesting. You buy nice knives and you beat on them and you have them sharpened and you keep beating on them. Yeah. <laughs> and if it breaks, no, and it sucks, all good. and so, I won't buy it again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no flexibility is a function of geometry. Not so much the alloy. Uh, what alloy you make it out of dictates like how far you can bend something. But if I made a knife out of 1095 and made one out of S30V, if they're both exactly the same geometry, they're both going to flex the same amount. Okay. It's just whether or not you can keep bending it, which even with a bony knife or even a fillet knife, you shouldn't bend it that far sure. enough to break it anyway. Yeah. So, so and you, you, yeah. We all know you, you uh, you know, knives have to be heat treated and hardened and all that. Do you want to dive into that? Because that, sure. that always seems like a touch of 
black magic to me. And I realize it's pure it science. Is. I, it's I it's witchcraft. It's pure science, but you know, it's something I don't. Well, I know nothing it's... about. So first off, the heat treat is sort of like the uh, if anybody that's into cars. I'm only. I only know a little bit about cars because my brother's a gearhead and my dad's a gearhead. So, um, but like with modern cars, you know, you can have a really, really nice car. And if it has a bad tune, you know, the computer's tuned poorly, it's not going to perform well. And that's kind of like what your heat treat is like. You can have, and with, with rifles and stuff, you can have a really, really bad reload, like mm-hmm. very, you know, poor quality control as far as what load you're doing. And the bullet might be inappropriate for, you know, inappropriate weight for your twist rate. And all that, and it's gonna, it's gonna pattern or it's not gonna group. And that's the same with heat treat. You can have the best steel on the market. And if your heat treat sucks, the knife's gonna suck. So, and likewise, if you have a really good heat treat with a mediocre steel, you can have a phenomenal knife. So, ideally, you wanna have a good heat treat with a good steel. And then you have something that's absolutely stellar. And basically, your heat treat is controlled hardening of the steel. So you have the optimal amount of corrosion resistance, the optimal uh, toughness, and you know, edge retention, because those things all go kind of hand in hand. Basically, what you're doing is you're starting with a soft piece of steel that's been softened, and that's just so it's more machinable. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing gets put into an oven for, depending on what kind of steel it is, you know, it might be wrapped in foil, it might just be thrown in, and you bring it up to whatever temperature that steel is prescribed to go to and usually anywhere between 1500 and 2100 degrees and then it's shocked into being cold and that's uh yeah depending on the steel it could be either dipped into water or oil or it could be clamped between two aluminum plates and that rapidly cools down the knife at a specific rate which then makes it as hard as glass like if you drop it on the ground it would shatter and so at that point, it would hold a really, really good edge, but it's not durable at all. It's the tiniest flex is going to break it because it's so hard. So at that point, you put it into an oven and bring it up to a temperature that softens it enough back that it's going to be durable like a finished knife, but it's still going to hold an edge. That's called tempering. Yeah. So you, and you want to bring that's it, sorry in a nutshell. You want to bring it up to a super... You want to bring it up to a super hardening and then back it down. Yes, okay. yeah, because you can't you can't bring it up from the bottom up to the point you want it to be at. You have to bring it way over to the max hardness and okay. then bring it down to the point that you want it at. And there's, I mean, way more technical like aspects sure. to it, like S30V and AEBL, for example. I do a cryogenic treatment in addition, and that's I have a vat of liquid nitrogen, and I mean it's. 310 below zero, I think, if I recall. And I mean, you can you can put a blade of grass in it, pull it out and shatter it like glass. It's yeah. so cold. And I'll pull the knife out of heat treat, I'll quench it, and then once it's down to room temperature, I'll lower into the liquid nitrogen for an hour. And that helps refine the grain structure even more before I do my temper cycle. Wow. So there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do, uh, depending on the alloy and some things, I mean, people are always experimenting, trying to push the boundaries and, mm-hmm. you know, get a little more performance. That's, that's, huh. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I didn't know about the liquid nitrogen. Yeah, Everything fun. else you talked about, I was like, I was like, I, I'm tracking, I'm tracking liquid nitrogen. I like this. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. And, uh, I mean, like, and like I said, there's some steels where you're only going up to like 1500 degrees and you literally just put the knife in the oven. 1500 degrees, it's ready to go, you quench it. With some of the steels I'm working with, like S35, you're getting it so hot that the whole thing would just oxidize and turn to scale and be useless in the oven. So you have to wrap it in stainless steel foil in these packets that are completely airtight, so that way they stay nice. (laughs) When you pull them out of the foil, you still have a knife, you don't have just a pile of scale, because you're just getting them so hot. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a lot of fun. Huh. I'm laughing. I'm laughing at your puppy. I'm sorry, Jared. <laughs> Jared's dog joined him on on the Zoom. It's great. Um, She's pretty nosy. <laughs> Jared, feel free to chime in at any point here. Um, I'm just, and I am learning so much. Me and Evan talked briefly about these steels, and I mean, it was like talking rocket science. I'm not by any means. Uh, yeah. well-versed on the knife-making scene. 
And so when Evan and I spoke a couple months ago, he kind of talked about some of this stuff and I'm just trying to relearn it right, and right in here, here and learn as much as I can. Right there with you. So I, I guess one of the things to talk about, now that we're talking about like heat treating and stuff like that, that's kind of something that can guide someone. But what about even in your style of knives, someone that, let's say I, a jack of all trades knife. I know this is kind of a harder thing to do, but like someone that does a little bit of camp, uh, preparations for like cooking but they also want a skinner uh what would be what someone would look for for just having something that'll do a little bit of everything you talked about drop point and all that stuff yeah so Um, like what you're looking at there is you want to make sure you have a steel that's going to hold an edge and be corrosion resistant enough because like i mean Corrosion resistance is pretty popular of a thing to be concerned about anyway. For but sure. When you're deal- dealing with animals, like other than blood, which is kind of corrosive, uh, you're not dealing with a whole lot, especially in Texas, depending on what part you're in. You know, it, it's pretty dry. It's pretty warm. It's not like you're in Florida, <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, or, or, you know, the, the Pacific Northwest where you have like salt sea air and stuff. So, I mean, other than the coast, obviously, but. The, uh, with, with dealing with food and stuff, you're slicing things like citrus fruits and potato, you know, stuff like potatoes. All those things react with steel mm. and will darken the steel or induce rust. And so you want to make sure you have something that's going to be, you know, compatible with that without rusting or darkening a whole lot. And then you also want something that is going to be thin because like while you, you can, you can skin a deer with a sharpened, uh, splitting wedge. If it's, you know, it's in a steel that you can, yeah, you know, sharpen and hold an edge with. Mm. Uh, when you're cutting something like an apple or a potato in half, that wedge is just going to break and pop apart the, the fruit that you're cutting as opposed to cut it. And so that's where you want some thinness. And you can, you can skin and you can work, you know, on animals with a thin knife, but you can't really do that very well with a thick knife when it comes to food prep. So that's kind of what I would look towards. Something with a high grind and with a thin spine just so it slices well. Mm-hmm. And then, like I said, I'd want it in something that's going to be durable enough to handle the rigors of breaking down animals because, you know, your needs in the kitchen aren't particularly abusive when it comes to, you know, prying and twisting and things like that. But when you're working with an animal, you know, especially quartering an animal, sometimes you get into tight places and need some of that extra strength. Yeah. I mean, I've totally, I've, I've gone, I feel like I've gone the gambit with, or how do you say it? Gamut. Gamut. G-A-M-U-T. Yeah, I always say it that wrong. I'm thinking of the X-Men character. Uh, card throwing. Word dude. up. I got you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> anyways, I, I feel like I've, I've gone through a lot of different knives and knife shapes in my skinning. I love skinning animals. Like, that's, me, me and uh, Austin are normally in the group the ones that jump in and really want to be hands-on. When someone kills an animal, we want to be there because I just enjoy it. Uh, but I've gone through the replaceable blades. I have the the uh, Gerber yeah, Vital, which one. is like the little scalpel one, which I've loved. Um, I've worked with uh, guides that use... All they do is go to... Uh, Sam's and buy paring knives and just use them till they're nothing and then throw them away and go buy more, which works. I've obviously enjoyed it, but I've worked through, I don't even know what model it is. I was given an old buck knife that was in a safe of my wife's grandfather's from got the sixties. It's a trailing point. Yeah. Now that I've been been learned, yeah, by Evan here, and uh, it's a trailing point. It has been one of my favorites. It's nice and heavy. It you skins can, nice. It skins really good. I love it. Uh, and and that's kind of what where, where I was going. With my question about having like a jack of all trades, because like you were saying, you, you, it it falls down in some points where like I'm like ah, you know, like this is kind of doesn't really work for this, but it'll do it, you know, this, that, and the other, but 
having that versatility works, but uh, everything that you've said really points to what I was trying to get at is how having a knife that does one thing and the other, a jackball trades really seems not what you're going for. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Like, like, and yeah, doing a jack of all trades build, it's tough because yeah. at that point you are giving up something everywhere. Yes. You're always giving up something literally everywhere on the jack of all trades knife, but you're gaining something everywhere too. And that's kind of moving all the sliders to the middle is what you're kind of shooting for. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of doing custom work is you have the option of going extreme in one angle or one aspect and, you know, really specializing. I do, I do all of them. I do, you know, jack of all trades build. I do stuff that's specialized. I've got fillet knives, for example. That's mm. as specialized as it gets. Um, you know, and so you can, you can go all the way, all into one aspect or kind of go jack of all trades. But yeah, that's, that's one of those things that you're never going to have something that does everything well. But dang it, you can get pretty close <laughs> if you know what you're trying to do. For sure. Uh, we, when we were looking at your website earlier, Jordan was talking about we we use machetes a lot when we're waterfowl hunting yes. to, to knock branches yeah. down to can you know, kind of rough in blinds and boats and all that. It's like man, this guy's machete, Evan's machetes. It would be so awesome. I said I I couldn't. I there's for the <laughs> for the amount of abuse that we give to these you know the mud and the water and just in boats and i i i <laughs> i couldn't do it to a nice piece of equipment like yours though to me these these machetes we need to waterfowl hunt are the you know academy which sporting goods store down here in texas um sog machetes that are what 40 bucks and yeah. you beat on them for three or four <laughs> years and you throw them away <laughs> i mean but then you get into your chef's knife, your bony knife. Like, all right, that's a piece of equipment I'm into. Or that you know that whiskey jack and doing some skinning. But to, 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 you were speaking of whiskey jack and skinning. You said you you use some other skinners um, on your Instagram. You you you, you field test a lot, and we believe you very much so because you, you know <laughs> you're doing uh, uh, all this uh, moonlighting a taxidermist joint um and just in skin and deer with them that that's hell of a way to field test right i mean that's, oh that's, yeah that's it's great so versus the, like, uh, oh I, I bought a knife from a guy who said he field tests but you know i've seen a video of you cutting <laughs> up deer so yeah this guy does it um talk about yeah, that my man. taxidermist i i yeah i dropped off i dropped off an animal there and we were talking and i said man you know like it's. I told my. I thought to myself, it's never a bad idea to have a good relationship with your tax term, no especially <laughs> if you're going full time as a knife maker, right? <laughs> and so I was like, hey, you know, Jeremy, how about? Would you want a knife? I'll make you a knife. You know, all, all I ask is that you, you know, flash it to some customers that let them see it. You know, and he's like, no, yeah, you know. And I thought, you know, maybe I get the in on in with this guy. It's never a good idea to have a relationship with your tax term. So I do that, and he uh, says, you know, hey. Um, you're going full time, right? And I said, yeah. He said, if you ever need any extra work, I could always use a guy that's skin to skin like during the week because you now hunters like to talk. So he, he likes to talk. So a hunter drops off a deer instead of signing his name, filling out the paper and leaving. He's there for two hours telling hunting stories mm-hmm. and he's got like eight more hunters behind him. So it's like all day filling out paperwork and shooting crap. And so sure. it's like the deer all sit in the cooler waiting to be skinned on Monday and then processed on, you know, Wednesday, uh, once they've had plenty of time to hang. And, uh, he's like, man, I, I could really use the help. So I said, sure. So I worked my schedule and every Monday I go in and I just skin a pile of deer. It's a great opportunity to test alloys, test my heat treat regimen and, uh, also new designs like I did this week. So it's a good way to both test, like as far as ergonomics and blade angles and things like that. Also, I can quantify stuff. I can tell somebody, hey, I, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can do eight deer start to finish with this knife <laughs> without ever touching any type of sharpening implement. Mm. So or that's... like I did this past week, other than touching a chef's steel, which doesn't sharpen a knife for the record, yeah. it just straightens your edge. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I did 15 deer start to finish. Uh, nine of them were caping jobs, you know, caping all the way up to the base of the head and never sharpened the knife. And it was still like, if I wasn't careful, it would slice through hide. Like it was really aggressive still. That's and awesome. all I did was touch a chef's steel to straighten the edge up once in a while. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to the most about getting one of your knives, Evan. Um, you know, work as a hunting guide, we might have eight, ten guys at camp and, and, uh, you know, if they all shoot something or half of them shoot something in the morning, you know, those, you know that's four in. Yeah, we got a lot of work to get done. And right now, you know, I've run a couple different knives, um, just like your cheap outdoor edge, yeah. fixed blade and replaceable blades. And, you know, they're not really, I mean, yeah, you got to sharpen them halfway through one deer or, um, one pig or whatever you're cleaning out. Pigs, um, shit, pigs, holy shit. Uh, oh, yeah. Especially, <laughs> especially cutting through some of that coarse hair. You yep, know, if we exactly. get a bunch of pig that hunters in camp. the worst of it. Yeah. It's, it can really do some damage to your knife. And that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Like, I've got a couple, you know, I'm not really a big knife. I've had like the Walmart specials for years. And, um, um, Jacob actually gifted me one of the bench maids. It's got the same S30V that Jordan's got. And, um, uh, I'm very careful with that. That's my like everyday carry knife. You know, I'm not cutting cardboard. Like I'm very, you know, careful about what I cut. <laughs> you don't have to worry it. about and, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for taking the risk for me. Yeah. And, uh, I'm here for that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but you know, when it comes to my everyday carry knife, I'm kind of, I'm pretty careful with it. But when I'm, when I get Evan's knife, I'm, I'm ready to like actually put some work behind it and see, you know, how many deer, how many pigs and how many exotics I can get through without ever having to go back to the sharpening table. You'll be pretty happy with it. I think. <laughs> yeah. I think I you were telling that, telling me that, um, Bill Reyes went through what six pronghorn at camp and without ever having to sharpen his, uh, his knife that he gifted Danny. Yeah. Yep. So that was in AEBL, which is my base model, you know, me and potato steel, and that was with my old heat treat regimen, which I actually farmed out back when I was part time. I farmed out my heat treat to somebody who uh, did my heat treating for me because I didn't have the equipment yet. And now that I have my own equipment, my heat treatment is even better. It's really good. <laughs> and those uh, fifteen deer I did, that was with the same steel, AEBL, and I was it was still zinging through hide at the end of the day. That's awesome. And I actually left the knife because it was a prototype. I left it with my taxidermist for him to work with for the week. And I don't think he's going to sharpen it the entire time. He's probably going to maybe touch it to a steel, but I doubt he'll need to. So, so I'll be interested to see how many deer he puts on that before I pick it back up Monday. Now that now that we're kind of on the sharpening subject, yep. how do you recommend your sharp? Like, what's your sharpening technique, Evan? Oh, <laughs> that's. That's like uh, that's like asking like what kind of food do you eat? I eat everything. I'm like a human raccoon. Um, I <laughs> I, uh, I sharpen depending on it depends on the you know equipment available and what knife I'm working with. If I'm working with a big knife, I cheat and I run it on my grinder, which is not a regular bench grinder. It's a belt grinder. It's the same way I make my knives, so I, I cheat. But if I'm in the field or if I'm you know backpacking or at a friend's house. I'll sharpen with a stone. I'll sharpen with, uh, one of my favorite ways is wet, dry sandpaper, like the automotive grade stuff you use for <laughs> buffing out scratches. You get a piece of like a thousand grit or 800 grit and put that either on a piece of leather or like an old mouse pad or something like that. And with a little bit of water and instead of pushing it, you drag it. Otherwise yeah. it's sharpening just like you would with a stone. And that maintains the convex curvature of my edges and does a great job. And then afterwards you can either touch it on a uh, a chef steel hone or you can strop it on a belt and at that point you're ready to go again so would you recommend recommend the same backwards motion on like a whetstone no on a stone it's not necessary so it, it doesn't matter on a stone if you're going forward or backward oh. it's still grinding and you're still going to make that burr edge that you have to buff off with a uh with a belt or with a, a steel strop. or something like that yeah okay. strop and so it doesn't matter with the stone. With paper, the reason why you drag is because you don't want to inadvertently catch the paper and then slice through it, which does two okay. things. One, it cuts your paper, which, you know, when I have to get a new piece. And two, as you're cutting it, you're abrading the living daylights out of your edge because you're cutting through 
all that abrasive. Hmm. So that it's easier sense. to just drag it. That's all super right. interesting. Yeah. Jared, what? So, either one works. Are you, are you going to talk to Evan to kind of do a custom build, or you got something picked out of his arsenal, or what do you think? Man, I like all of his work. You know, you know how my Instagram <laughs> will uh, <laughs> will uh, suggest like all yeah. the stories that you view the most in front. Yep, I would. I'd say that Evan's probably right there up front with a couple other people. But Evan, I'm watching all of his stuff. I'm always looking at, and can I'm, I actually just put my name on the list for his because he's, he's like on a six month waiting list. So I just put my name on the list, um, I'd say about two weeks ago for a custom knife, and I'm just kind of getting ideas right now. Um, but me, I mean, Evan talked about, um, about this a couple months ago, and, uh, it's crazy. I- I'll let him explain more in detail, but it's crazy, like all the stuff that he can do and like all the, the scales and the, and the pins and the. Oh, yeah. Jordan, I yeah, yeah, like that. Like that his one access with the glow to this stuff in the dark is crazy. scales. I was like, I don't know, glow in the dark's kind of cool. Like, I'll, if I drop that thing in the woods or, you know, I, I, in the last handful of years, you know, you see all this hunting equipment. It's all camouflage. And camo's yeah. cool. Yep. I've got camo button downs that I wear to work. I like camo. <laughs> um, but, but certain implements I don't feel should be camo. Things that you can drop in the leaves. Like, you don't want I camo. don't think knife handles should be camo. <laughs> I don't think memory cards. Yeah. Memory card holders should be camo. I think they should all be orange or yellow <laughs> or glow in the dark. Well, when, I, when I tell people, when, I, when I'm working with a customer and picking out stuff, and they're trying to pick out the color for their Kydex sheath, <laughs> they're like, ah, oh, I'm thinking like maybe real tree, bottomland, or maybe Cryptek Highlander. Like, and I'm oh, like, you're okay, buy I'm going to stop you right there. That's cool. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like here, I, let me, uh, let me let me point something out. They're like, well, "What's that?" I'm like, "The cool thing about camo is it blends in." They're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "The bad thing about camo is it, it blends, blends in." in. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, when do you shoot? When do you shoot deer? When do you shoot an elk? It's either first light or last light, almost always. Uh-huh. And more often than not, it seems like it's last light. So you shoot that elk, you stick an arrow in him, and you give it twenty, thirty minutes, and then you follow the blood trail by headlamp light across a mountainside, and you find him piled up. And now it's like, well, the, the race is on. I've got to get that animal broke down. So you pull out your kill kit. You whip out your Symbita customized Meadowlark. Wink at the camera. Glint off my teeth. And uh, <laughs> you uh, <laughs> pull, pull out the sheath. You throw the sheath to the side and you start working. And it when never you're exists done, again. you're like covered. Yeah, you're, you're, cu- you're done. You're covered in blood and fat. And well, probably you're not blood exhausted. because you've done your job and you put it through the boiler room. But where's the sheath at? Well, it's probably 15 yards uphill buried in some sedge or something because as you're working on your elk, you move downhill because gravity is a thing, and you can't find it because <laughs> you were dumb and didn't listen to Evan, and you yep. got it in camo. So Absolutely. I, I, uh, I always tell people, like, bright green or bright orange, especially totally. with, like, like the meadow lark or something like that. You're going to put it in your kill kit. You're not going to wear it in your belt. Exactly. So, bright color. Exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. Yep. My headlamp. You know, I don't I don't wear a headlamp sitting in a tree. You know, we do a lot of tree hunting around here in Texas. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I saddle hunt. I Most of my random little pieces of things, I try to buy in orange. Because I'm going to drop them out of the tree. It's without, without a question. It's going to get dropped. So my headlamp. Yeah, I'm wandering in with a headlamp on. Well, that orange headlamp isn't staying on my head all day. I mean, then there's the argument of, you know, deers can't see orange, but I'm going to take the head, that lamp off and put it in my pocket or in my backpack or whatever. My, my knife in the kill kit, in the backpack. It just yep. buy thing. Camo is appro- very, very appropriate for while you're hunting. But anything that isn't super necessary in the moment. Get it in orange. <laughs> That's my opinion. I agree with you, man. But I yeah, also, well, I also and here's the thing things. too. Like, uh, well, you, you mentioned like deer not being able not being able to see it, so people argue it's not a big deal. Even if that said, even if that's true, and I tend to feel like it's mostly true yeah. that deer can't really see orange. At least they're not bothered by it. Hunters can see orange, mm-hmm. and like <laughs> it's the same thing. The cool thing about hunter orange is other hunters can see you. Mm-hmm. The bad thing is other hunters can see you and if you hunt public 
a lot of times, once you get up in your tree, you don't want somebody else seeing your hunter orange, like whatever. Like during bow season here in Ohio, you don't have to have hunter orange on. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I don't want some other hunter seeing me up on a ridge somewhere, tucked into a fork in a tree or whatever, hunting my spot because until they see where I'm at, Nobody knows that there's any reason to be stupid enough to go as far back as I go. But that orange, you can see from way off. For sure. So, yeah, it makes sense to hide your orange. Absolutely. But but put your knife in your backpack. Yeah. And make it orange. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But you mentioned handle materials, like scale materials and stuff. Man, there is so much crazy stuff to choose from out there. Like, I can... Like, people have asked me, like, what what are my choices? That's what and I was about to ask. My answer is always, my, my answer is always, I can make it out of anything that's not illegal to own. I mean that literally. So, anything, pretty much anything other than marine mammal bone and, like, post-ban ivory. Other than that, I can pretty much get it. What, Just whether or not you're willing to pay for it. What's your, what's your preferred? As, I mean, an average Joe day-to-day. Oh, synthetics. I like synthetics a whole lot. So there's one synthetic in particular I use a lot of. It's called G Carta. And that's sort of yeah. like a, a punny play on names because there's a trademark name called My Carta. It's been around since like, I think the 1920s. And it's, it's a synthetic composite of resin, specifically phenolic resin and fabric. So it's either linen, canvas or paper with phenolic resin. And it makes this hard, like, wood-like material that you grind and shape looks kind of like wood and it's really tough like you know you see that like fiber impregnated concrete Mm -hmm. how it's like much harder to break and and screw up than regular concrete it's kind of like that all those fibers everywhere it's crazy tough and with g carta it's a hand laid version of that with epoxy resin and the guy that lays the composites in idaho he does all kinds of crazy colors so, like, he's got one called Mexican Blanket, and yes. he layers it up real thick, like two inches thick, and then slices them crossways. So you have all these layering stripes of different colors. Looks kind of like a Mexican southwestern point blanket. That's Looks cool. really cool. And tons of other stuff like that, you know. So they're tough. They're kind of grippy. They've got, like, a sat- I, I put a, fat- a satin finish on them, so they're kind of grippy. And they look really nice, and they weather well. So that's kind of what I lean towards, and there's tons of room to be creative with it. I mean, he's got like a hundred different patterns. It's funny. So. It's funny you brought up the Mexican blanket because that was probably one of the only knives of yours I've sent to Austin. I was like, I need these handles in my life because I yep. love the Mexican <laughs> Mexican blanket. I'm a hot rodder, and if anyone knows anything about hot rods, like especially old school Mexican blankets, are a thing for seat covers and. Oh, <laughs> I, I, lo- I love that shit, and that that actually was like I have to get one of these. <laughs> That's a pretty cool one. Like I, I've got a couple knives in it. I've got one on the bench right now. And uh, if I ever pull one up for open sale, most of what I do is custom work. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, I'll do an open sale knife. Guaranteed, if it's in Mexican blanket, it's gone right away. Yeah, so I'm afraid. You of. know, and it's you. You mentioned <laughs> that. That's what I was about to ask. You know, Jared said he well, got, he got on the books, um, and about six months out, which is great. But do you you there's you don't do any? I I know you're probably a one man show from everything I've gathered. You don't do yeah. anything standard production. Everything's custom, correct? Everything's custom. Yeah, yeah like I do do one that is. Uh, I guess you can call it sort of semi production. And that is, I do a knife for another podcast, the Backcountry Hunting Podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, me and him sort of collaborated and came up with a knife together that was a, he had some ideas of a modification of a knife that I already had in my lineup. And he said, well, hey, what if we did this? And basically it's sort of exclusive for his podcast. So if people listen to it, once in a while I'll announce that we'll do a run and it'll be like 25 of them. There'll be serial numbered knives. And it's like a limited edition. That's the only knife that I don't offer for custom order. Sure. only available that way and that's sort of a production run like i do at 25 at a time other than that everything else is pretty much just custom whatever I'm, hey get away from that <laughs> my dog is sifting my plate um <laughs> the uh <laughs> she's like hey that rye toast smells good um 
but yeah, so other than that, it's just custom work or, you know, either whatever the customer wants or me flexing my creativity, doing an open, you know, open sale knife, which is where I, you know, every week I do five or six custom knives and then I'll do one or two depending on how much, you know, how much energy I have or whatever I feel like doing. I'll do a couple extra knives and I'll just put them up for open sale. And that gives me the opportunity to use materials I got mm-hmm. either on a whim, say I saw a cool handle material. Man, I want to use that, but I'm not going to wait for somebody to be like, oh, I was kind of looking for this. I'll just make something out of it and put it up for open sale. And that gives people the option if they don't want to wait on the wait list, they have an option to just grab something. Or a strike the that they're like, I got to have that. Yeah, or, or that too. And like, yeah. I mean, Christmas is coming, so. The impulsive well, buyers out there have something to go for. Yeah, so, so like, before you have an open sale, you need to text us first. Yeah, like right? kind of let the kind of <laughs> let the boys know, man. We're in the club, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that, yeah, it, it's like uh, you get you get rewarded for waiting on the list by getting exactly what you want, and you get oh, rewarded or, or you give that up by buying an open sale knife. But the benefit is to the maker, you know me. I get a chance to use up materials that maybe I got a good deal on, or maybe I get to work with something that nobody will ask for because they don't know it exists. So, mm. yeah, everybody wins either way. No, that's that's super great. Well, we we've talked a lot about knives. What I mean, you you, you clearly cut up a lot of deer. You 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 and I'm a few. You, you, yeah, <laughs> a couple. Um, it, it is whitetail hunting. Is that your favorite hunt? What 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 is your favorite hunting to do? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say whitetail hunting is my favorite. My favorite is anything out west. Okay. I just can't get out west very often sure. uh, due to logistics. But, yeah, I, I hunt whitetail here. I like small game a lot. Waterfowl is fun, although I don't have any good public here to hunt on you know, for, for waterfowl. There's tons of public land where I'm at in Ohio. Mm-hmm. But there's no good waterfowl hunting on public other than wood ducks and mergansers. So it's a lot of sort of jump shooting or spot and stalking. Sure. For those, I'm getting into some predator hunting. I do some turkey hunting in the spring. Um, I don't know if I don't know if I really have a favorite. It's pretty much whatever's in season. Mm. I just like hunting a lot. We understand that mentality. Yeah. I this year my my bucket list for the year was shooting big buck, and I shot a decent Check. deer. So now we're on to uh, waterfowl. And at the end of the day, if somebody asks me. And we go through this often, so anybody who's listened, we get it. I mean, you've heard this. If you could shoot, a, not a lifetime buck, but a real nice buck, or a real nice mixed bag of waterfowl, what are you shooting? Oh, the nice buck. Are you? Yeah. All right, all right. Cause I'm taking the waterfowl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, what Actually, are you shooting? Well, man, that's, that's I, tough. I like them both a lot. I like them both a lot. But if I shot a really nice buck, there's a good chance I did it with a bow. And since I don't have a re- like a a compound or a crossbow anymore, that means I did it. Not only did I kill something with my recurve, but I killed something exceptional with my recurve. So I'm okay with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, word, word, no, word. Also, I get to eat. I get to eat. I get to eat on that buck a lot longer than those ducks too. Ab- absolutely. No, See, that, that that that's a hundred percent logical. I, I wasn't going for logic; I was going for enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's tough for me because I got my I got started in hunting hunting waterfowl, and to this day I don't do it as much as I like to. I did the North Texas public land. That's where we're at, man. Hunting. Yeah, I mean, and and and, and it's tough. It's really tough it work, a but it's also it is a very much a grind, and uh, um. I still love waterfowl. I don't get to do it as much as I as I used to. Um, but seeing those those ducks lock up and they're coming oh. to your spread, I mean, they, it doesn't matter how cold it is. It doesn't matter like if the body aches. Everything doesn't matter where you're right at then. or what you're. E- everything is like yeah. You see those cups, those ducks come up over the horizon and they cup up and they dump into your spread. I mean, I've got goosebumps. I don't right know. Now. Yeah, <laughs> that's. That's what's up. It's tough. That's <laughs> tough. It's a, that'd be a tough. Uh, no, make the call. You got to make the call, man. You got to make the call. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking. All right, nice bag here. We're talking. You know, let's say you know Central Texas, Central South. You know, 
redhead, nice widgeon, a mallard, maybe mm. a stray mallard, um, a blue bill. Make, make a it a little easier for him. Make make it easier on him. There's a gun to his head and the clock is ticking. He's got no, a 30 no. Dude. <laughs> they, you know, they, you know, Evan, here in Texas, why is we a life see, and death decision? Nobody knows. We see, here in Texas, it, you know, no, if you go from why, where, why? where we're at, because it's hunting. <laughs> if yeah, Evan, if you go from where we're at here in DFW, you know, down to the coast, we see ninety nine percent of species of ducks. Mm-hmm. So yeah. in our wow. state, in our state, you can shoot on, on most ducks. You know, obviously, you can not, even shoot. You can shoot divers this far north too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, I, I mean, mean clearly wow. we don't see sea ducks, but I mean, I I haven't I haven't hunted near as much waterfowl as a lot of people, and I've shot every species I've named. Other than I haven't shot a redhead, I've never shot a canvas back, but I've shot widgeon, ruddy, pintail, wood duck, bufflehead, mallard. I ain't shot half of that. Wow. I shot. I think I've shot one mallard drake my entire life. Really? Holy shit. We yeah. shot like but, two, two years ago here but, in North Texas on a lake that we can talk about after this. All right, so we shot a hundred. Wow. On not, public? That's not a lie. <laughs> on public land? Yes, sir. Wow. So I don't get to do the much public land hunting. We went out a couple years ago Perf. with uh, with an outfitter um, and we actually shot a blue goose. What? And the, yeah. Yeah, we shot we shot two Canadas and a blue goose, um, and the guide that we were with was like, I've never seen in the five years <laughs> I've been guiding here in North Texas, I've never seen a blue goose shot, and it was up by like the McKinney, Princeton, Sherman mm-hmm. kind of area. Wow, yeah, That's dog the dog wouldn't even grab it. Dog didn't know what it was. <laughs> 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 but I don't know. I think I'd probably have to say. I'd probably have to say buck of a lifetime. Oh. Or buck cl- yeah, not lifetime. Now, we're not I mean, lifetime. You say buck lifetime, vi- we're all going to say, we're shooting that antler thing. Yeah. Every one of us so, in here. <laughs> so, so, so like, like my PBE is probably like a hundred, 120 inch deer. Mm-hmm. So like, that's very, that's you, mine too. By all means. You know, it's, uh, if, if that, it might not even go that much. Um, but I don't, I, I just feel like, if I had that one opportunity to shoot a good mix bag or that one good buck, I feel like I'd have more opportunity in the future to shoot a good mix bag than I would a good buck. See, I disagree with that, but yeah. that's the beauty of the question, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, I, go I mix get bag. it. I get it. I'm going mixed bag, man. Cause I feel like grinding it out. I can find it. I could find a nice buck if I just hammered it and got one on camera and just found it. Yeah. Something but young. I mean, but a mixed there's bag, a lot more. There's a lot more good mixed bags than there are, you know, you know, quote unquote lifetime bucks. You know what I mean? No, not lifetime though. Not yeah, lifetime. we're not, not lifetime. lifetime. I'm, not like, talking, lifetime. I'm not talking two hundred like inch. A, a, a I'm good... not talking normal non high fence. Like, uh, you, oh, holy shit! I stumbled upon a two hundred inch deer kind of lifetime. I'm talking, okay. you know, the a, kind that you would call your buddy about and be solid, like, dude, check this shit out. Like, like I've seen you pictures. A one fifty. A solid, yeah. solid deer in Texas, yeah. not on high fence, but not, not, I mean, you say well, okay. to any of us here, like, you want to shoot a 200-inch wide white tail on public or a mixed bag, throw those birds in the trash can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. that's all. No, no. It's, it, it's a, Man, it's that, a point That reminds of, me. We, uh, we were talking earlier about the deer I skinned. Last week or the week before, I skinned a deer that was the biggest deer I've ever laid hands on, and it was a hundred and sixty-three pound hanging weight. Wow, that's a big deer. That is a big deer. That's like after being caped out, the head gone, the forelegs gone, no hide, no guts, just meat and bone. And we did the math, and that was like around two seventy-five, pushing three hundred live weight. White cheese. Wow. I, I I don't know how to how to imagine. Dragging that out of the woods. Oh my gosh! With the with the tractor. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna yeah. say uh, <laughs> side by side, <laughs> side by side. Something. I'd call someone and be like, "I'm I'm sending this four wheeler in after this." I and mean, Evan, what Texas? You know, Texas deer aren't. You know, there. I forget there is the Bergman principle. I forget. Yeah. And you don't quote yeah. me on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, everything. The, 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 I think it's the founders principle, isn't it? Isn't it the founders principle? 
I, I don't, I don't yeah, know. I'm I forget the two. Yeah, dumb. but yeah, yeah everything's big, bigger, bigger animals. Are bigger animals the farther away from the equator you get. No. So I yeah, I shot this I, for, you know, at least two weeks ago. I shot the nicest buck I've ever shot. He's right at 120 inches, 150 pounds on the hoof, and it's the top 10 deer that have been shot in that lease in 30 years. And wow, it's a it's yeah. a badass it's deer. a solid deer. I couldn't be happier to have done it. Very very. Where's your lease at? Uh, Je- near Jefferson. Oh, okay, yeah, I've been yeah, out that getting, way. Yeah, yeah. so well, that's a good that's a good East Texas. Boat. Yeah, so it's a good East Texas deer. Uh, we have family who has property just just north of the border in Oklahoma. My wife shot a a crazy atypical deer up there last year, twenty seven or twenty nine inch spread. Wow, two hundred on the hoof, but he, I mean his points are an inch. Yeah, so it's kind of like it, an eight point, but it, not. It was like it, you it's told a him, cool like, deer. "Hey, man." You can be whatever you want. And he tried to be an elk, but didn't quite work it out. It's just the weirdest deer. <laughs> she loves it. I think it's super cool. But he was 200 on the hoof, and that's a big deer for us. Yeah. Yeah, wow. that's no, that, like, that is a big deer for down that far south. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's crazy. We hear about stuff up y'all's way, getting up north. We have family up in Minnesota. You know, they shoot big deer. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a solid deer. Like, no, for us, that's a giant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's just crazy how much things yeah. vary. So, What's funny, though, is the antlers, the antlers don't trend that way, though. Nope. Antlers, like, don't seem to, tr- other than coos deer, like, when it comes to whitetail, like, a 200-inch whitetail is a 200-inch whitetail. It just might weigh about 200 pounds down by you, and it might weigh 350 up here. Yeah, well, I, think, I think that's Maybe genetic, not 350 here, but, you know. And I think it's, um, it is Bergman's. Bergman's yeah. rule organs, yeah, okay. the higher latitude should be larger and thicker. Um, but I, half of me, and this is based on nothing more than my opinion, which is worthless, <laughs> is that once, I mean, you see big, big racked deer further north. But once you get way further north, I feel like a lot of that energy and those nutrients are put into body weight and fat, to, you know, for, for cold weather. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big I time. mean, down in South Texas, granted, there's a lot of genetic uh, specifics that have been built, granted, yeah, yeah. you know, and escaped from high fence and all that business. But, you know, the, you know, there's plenty of food. It doesn't get that cold. They don't have to roll a big layer of fat. They're not big deer. So, yeah, they can build these big old head sticks to attract females and <laughs> and be cool <laughs> you know i mean head sticks i like that for for whatever and that that opinion's worth nothing so if anybody wants to email us just get after it like i know <laughs> <laughs> but no that that makes sense i mean shoot you think like here in ohio like it doesn't generally get cold that cold like by ohio standards where i'm at but we had one winter oh, six seven years ago it was a freak winter, and it got down to negative twenty at night, like so. What's three cold nights then? in a row? If that's real cold, what's cold for you? Yeah, a uh, cold. Cold for us here is like like the the low that's normal during the coldest month of the year is like eh, the teens. We bump that in DFW, and I mean bump it, a rarity. So, I mean below freezing here is cold for us. I'm talking thirty. Yeah. I think- well, I think the humidity has a lot to do with that as well. Yeah, I agree. Because it's like some of that stuff gets bone chilling cold, yeah. and I hate the cold. Oh, I'm right there with you, my friend. <laughs> I wear uh, my wife's, my uncle in law, he's a big dude, and he wears gear, and he's like, oh, it's not that cold. And I've got my gear on with a merino base layer, and they're like, yeah, I'm carrying my bib out with me. He's like, dude, it's 38. I'm like, yeah, I just don't like being cold, man. As soon as I get, as soon as I get in that pop up, <laughs> I'm just gonna sit here in my bib and be all nice and warm. I hate it. Oh yeah, there was there's been Ugh. some mornings I'd be out duck hunting and uh, my knees would lock up. And this Ugh. is before I learned how to layer properly, but Ugh. I'd have to I'd have to try to go to sleep just to forget about how bad it hurt. And then I hear my I hear my buddy start blowing the duck call next to me, and like we said before, all of it goes away. Yeah. I, I mean, we hunting all this public land, you know, right here, and you you well know what we're talking about, Jared. I, we get out there early, we stake our claim, we start setting stuff up, brushing our blind, and we're walking laps, you know, just shooting the bull, 
just trying like, all right, I'm cold. Just yep. walking around, stomping, you know, it, ugh, I hate it. I hate it, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely a love hate relationship for sure. Bucket list for yep. me is sea ducks on uh St. Paul Island, King Eiders. And I know that's yeah. stupid cold. So like my, my plan right now to make that happen in the next, you know, I don't know, decade is to slowly just start acquiring layers. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, buy a super <laughs> nice layer. Buy that, a super nice layer. Then I get there and I look like the kid from Christmas Story. Like, yeah, let's go shoot ducks! <laughs> <laughs> but what are, those, what are those Egyptian ducks? The, um, mm-hmm. I, the Egyptian, Egyptian geese? Or, or, mm-hmm. I can't remember the technical Something name for like them. That. It, but that would be nice. But those those tags are few and far between, I believe. Man, this year teal season here. It's so warm. You know, we, you, yeah, we, you know, we ended up. Yep. You know, we had our wading Cut. boots from like you know wading going down south to wade fish. We ended up wearing like you know uh, like fishing pants, like tech pants yep. of sorts. I don't know what else to call them. Not cotton, not uh, not jeans, not sweatpants. Convertible pants. Yeah, the ones like zip off zip-off things you buy at Academy. We wore those in wading boots for teal season, and that was the that was best the thing we've ever made. Best decision, best best move. How'd y'all do this till season? Crush! I crushed, crushed it. it. I shot what we had two weeks. I was hundred few I was, times. Yeah. I shot almost four limits. Yep. Right That's here, insane. right here by us. Would you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right here. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I was. Uh, Tro- yeah. Tro- okay. Tro- I know. Yeah. I know Trophy, exactly. What uh, we you're launched about. the boat at Trophy Club Park. We'll say that. I, I think, I think you've said too much, sir. Dude, they, they, <laughs> you can't, you can't get the permits are, you know, first come first. Long sir. gone by now. Long, they yeah. were gone. And in and, hours. La- and last till season, it wasn't that way. No, like sir. I mean, you're, you're, we we lucked out this year with the way everything convened. We went to uh, Louisiana, and the guy that we go with, the guide over there. He was talking about how this has been the craziest season for Teal for him. Like this year, he doesn't know what happened. They saw birds earlier in the year than they've ever seen, and they had birds all season. Really? Yeah, he was like, there was not a day in the season they didn't see birds. Which is weird because Abe, who's elk hunting, and myself... And his brother hunted in January in Louisiana with the same guide, same area, for speckle bellies. And, and we shot our birds, but it, it was some work to get them done. And mm-hmm. sitting around the lodge with that guy, I say lodge, his, his, the hunt house. The camp, the duck the camp. camp um, he's jawing about how bad it's been. He's never seen it this bad. If it continues like this, he can't do it anymore and this and that. And I mean, we, we, we got our birds, but then, you know. Things turned around, and yeah, that's January to now. Yeah, all of a sudden, it's the best thing he's ever seen. So, you never know. We, yeah, Evan, I'm sorry, we've we've sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> you might not know, this, but Evan. You come down to Texas, and we'll we'll we've got pigs we can shoot year round. We've got thermal exotics. We've got we've got exotics. We've got thermal. We've got night vision. We've got all we've got all manner of. Alcohol to drink. <laughs> True that. Don't, don't threaten me with a good time, dude. Bring it on. We, you got plenty of place to stay. Yep, dude. I would love to. That'd be awesome. You you hit us up after. Come on this with it and come I, on. I think I know. I think I know a couple guys that May, are in the business too. Maybe so. <laughs> maybe so. I see what you maybe we there. can uh, work out work out some horse trades. You know, some sharp stuff versus some uh, shooting opportunities or something. That I bet we. Can, I like sharp. Def- I like sharp things. I bet we can sort. That, that is out. definitely an opportunity. <laughs> What's funny is I've got a buddy that's in Oklahoma, and uh, I'm actually going to go down there for deer here in a couple weeks. And they've got hogs, like, but they're sort of hit and miss. They like got these, uh, like, uh, like drainage ditches or creeks that like sort of hedgerow and divide off the field somehow. And there's trees growing on those, and that's where the hogs chill out like all day. And they might come out in the nighttime. And then, like, so the guys that do shoot them, shoot them a thermal. Mm-hmm. And there, they don't keep them. Like, they shoot them, drag them off. It's like coyotes to them. They're like, eh, not worth the trouble. And when I told them that, like, that here, it's not like that at all. People go to game ranches and pay large amounts of money to shoot a pig that ate corn its whole life. And 
they had it butchered and everything else. He's like, really? We just throw ours in the ditch. And I was like, <laughs> that's a whole nother podcast. People pay sir. huge money for that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, people, people pay good money for that. Like, He's like, really? Nobody even likes them over here. <laughs> it's unreal, man. Wife and I, See, that's in Ohio, a, wife and I like, last summer in Oklahoma oh. went and shot 28 pigs we had in a trap. Uncle's trap. And we trap here in East Texas. I mean, last year we killed a couple hundred pigs. We didn't. Did we eat all of them? No. Did we give away as many as we could to buddies and people? Absolutely. Did we cut up back straps out of a bunch of them? Yep. So it's well, yeah, you'd be dumb not to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, totally worth it. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna it's, say we're about fifty yeah. fifty with uh, the killing hogs. Like, like you it's one of those things. Like you on a shoot, school night. Yeah, eh, yeah. Probably you not shoot one, you'd be up. like, ah, it's quitting time. Yeah. <laughs> we had we had a hunter in camp. We were sitting there. We were hunting rams, and this big old boar come piling in, and they were uh, these these rams were out in front of us. This big old boar comes piling in. And he's trying to fight all the rams that we were hunting. My hunter goes, I'm going to shoot that bully. Uh Uh-uh, none of that. (laughs) The pig turned broadside on me, smoked him. But, (laughs) I mean, they're just, down here, they they can be nuisances, you know? Can be. They are. Can be. (laughs) You know, it's funny. They're being nice right now. We've got got them here, but, like, well, (laughs) hogs in Ohio are kind of like Bigfoot. I didn't Everybody realize they got that the far thing. north. Mm-hmm. I didn't either. Uh, oh yeah, they, they go they go farther north than this. That's but like, crazy. They uh, we've got them here. Like I said, it's Bigfoot though. Like it's one of those things where there's a lot of people that are like, "Oh, I have a cousin that saw one," you know, whatever. But like everybody's like, "Yeah, yeah, Jimmy, go back to your liquor." Leave it <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> I like Jimmy. <laughs> that's just crazy. That's just crazy, Jimmy over there. He also says he sees the you know the Mothman and stuff. And uh, yes. <laughs> like, there's pictures and stuff like trail camera pictures. I I I like I went to college with some guys that while they were in college, like we went to Hawking College right where I live, and uh while they were in college they went on the weekend and shot a hog and they have pictures of them, you know, stand next to their hog or whatever, with their rifle and stuff. And so they're here, but it's like everybody is so like trigger happy about hogs. I mean everybody is everywhere, but in Ohio, they're particularly rabid about them. And so if like Somebody sees them in their back 40, like every window opens and everybody <laughs> in that house gets a, re- a weapon out and it's just like obliteration mode. Yeah. And those hogs Good. don't see another day. And so, Good. well, yeah. Yeah. Need to keep it that to way. Me, though, Cause you see on, you see on TV and in hunting magazines and stuff, they're like, come to Texas. We have so many hogs. We can't get rid of them all. And it's true. And, and like, and, and they are it's impossible an to get rid of, but it's like here in Ohio, we almost wish that they, a lot of us are like, we don't want the ecological problems, but dang, it'd be cool if one of us had an opportunity to shoot one. You don't get both, though, <laughs> my friend. Yeah, you don't get both. That's and that, yeah. that, that's yeah. a million dollar question that you know all, all quote, conf- conservation podcasts talk about. If you could push a yep. button yep. and they all disappear, would you do uh, it? Farmers yeah. say yes. Hunters? Some farmers. I, I got to think on this one. Some farmers, I love. They, they set, they, uh, here in Texas, they sell the same thing you're talking yeah, about. It's they easy to make hunt, six yeah. figures selling hog hunts in Texas. Yep. Everybody, yeah. yeah. It, it's crazy. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's you know, everybody talks about that. Do, you know, do you push a button? I don't know. I get it. Yeah. I like shooting well, I, pigs. I, think it was, I see what I, they do. Oh, yeah. All summer. I mean, our the least we have, it... it it's it's such a blessing. We we can go out. It's year round. It's not you know just one season or another. We take friends. We take family. It, everybody out there is super close. And you go out all summer and just hang out and shoot. And like hey, I'm gonna go, I think I'm gonna go hunt tonight. I'm like all right, go sit over here. We seen pigs there a bunch. You can just go shoot them year round. It's fun. Yeah. It's something to do. Huh. Would I yeah. get rid of that? Man, I don't know. Ugh. I can't answer. That's a tough sell. I can't answer yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. I honestly can't answer it. I think we're only looking at it from one side of the lens too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're not we're not, we're not farmers. We don't I mean we're we don't personally It doesn't affect my pro- livelihood. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And but if and it so did, I'd probably be like kill every last one of them tomorrow. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah, it's a it's a tough call. But 
I'd I'd personally say no. Yeah. But well, Jared, it's I'm, awesome to have you join us tonight, and Evan. If we, uh, thanks for having me. If we, yeah. If we, if if us and everyone listening need to take a piece of advice about about knives away from this podcast other than they should buy a knife from you because it's done correctly what what piece of knife advice should they take away uh just learn to be uh i don't know more capable with the knife you have i i I think a lot of people feel like they need to have and this is like the wrong thing to say as a knife maker (laughs) like yeah i'm supposed to be selling you on buying more knives but most people are always looking for that next thing that's going to fix what they're doing, you know, with, with their knives or with their gear, with their rifle, whatever else. And there's, the truth is you're a lot more capable with the tool you already have, or you can be more capable if you just spend more time learning how to use it properly. I helped a buddy break down a bear on a mountainside in Idaho. I think it was two years ago. And I used a knife that only had a one inch blade and it wasn't like a Havilon. It was a tiny little thing that I carry in my bino harness, like a backup. and did not feel like I was impeded at all. Would have rather had a bigger knife for sure, but uh just knowing how to use it and knowing how to properly um you know work on the animal and stuff made it so it wasn't a big, you know, hindrance. So I think if more people put in time, like the gut hook thing, learning how to use a knife the way it should be used, they'll get a lot more uh utility out of what they already have. And then once they go to buy a custom knife from somebody like me, they get even more than they would have gotten otherwise because they know what they're going after. That right. makes complete sense. It does. For sure. Our friend Abe, who's not here, God bless his soul. God bless. Can't can't <laughs> own a sharp knife to save his life. So we're going to make sure he, he gets on the it, list. I'm going to get on your list. It's so bad that uh, when uh, Austin goes and cooks at his house, he brings his own knives. I bring my own knives everywhere. <laughs> I'm just that guy. But... Just that guy. <laughs> I'd rather just have a knife versus using a shitty knife to somebody who's like, yeah, man, this one's sharp. I'm like, no, it's not. That's not a sharp knife at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's been a long time since you've been down to my house, but you don't bring knives to my house when you cook. Yeah, but you, you and your wife care about things like that. Yes. So it's different. True that. Well, Evan... Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Five, both of you. Yeah, um, thank you. As we wrap it up, you know, you you gave your knife advice. Shameless self plug. Yeah. yeah, tell tell everybody where they can find you, Evan. Well, the best way to get a hold of me is on Instagram, or best way to see my work. My website's still a work in progress, uh, so it's Simbita underscore Custom underscore Knives. And uh, if you don't mind, just spell throw it in the show notes. So that I way they can click will. on it or whatever. Absolutely. Spell it, though, but, because but otherwise, people don't read. I, I was going to say otherwise, they're perfectly cool with giving me a phone call. My number is 740-270-9057. It's all over the internet anyway. Um, shoot me a text message. Give me a phone call, whatever. This is what I do for a living. So I can absolutely make time to uh, to talk to anybody about knives. Perfect. Man, thank you so much. Jared, anything to thank close you. with? Man, I've learned a lot, and I really enjoyed uh, um, being here and talking to Evan about this, and I'm, I'm looking forward to his uh, his collection. It'll be my first custom knife. It'll be my first nice knife for myself, and so I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, Danny's got one, and he really likes it, and I'm really looking forward to putting one in my arsenal as well, and Put it to use. Absolutely. Yep, likewise. As soon as we get off air, we'll discuss this some more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Evan, Jared, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah. Adios. Thank you. Storm on a Creek is the best. Grinch, the captain.